<laughs> By the way, we, we should talk about this on the show, maybe, but I just want to like a little mouge bouge that I guess Go Jay ahead. Dyer talked about Taylor Swift and talked about her concerts. And I guess people have walked away from her concerts with amnesia and possessions. Yeah, it's it's whatchamacallit, duh. Well, yeah, sure. The like, new, you're talking about the new tour? You're talking about the new tour? I don't. So I guess she maybe. She's on a big tour right now, I think. Yeah, she, she came through Kansas City and it shut down okay. traffic on our highway. On like our biggest highway, it shut down traffic. Okay. Okay. But um, she basically, I guess she performs like a ritual in one of her videos and then does it on stage. And people have talked about like actual possessions and like amnesia, like not remembering the show. Yeah, afterwards. because it's stinking uh, Zena LaVey's like. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, she's like she's the new one. Right. What? Like the 2.0. Yeah. Yeah, LeVay's wife. Look at a picture of her. Uh, Antoine daughter. 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 Antoine daughter. Pull it up. Daughter. Pull it up right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me see. Let me see this. She's like she has made. Her name some... is Z Zena X E N A. Z E E N A or something like that. Or Anton oh, LeVay's I'll just, I'll just daughter. I'll look up Anton LeVay's daughter. Yeah, it. She's just the new model. Z Zena Shrek. Yeah, but like that might be her married name, or whatever. But like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've got her. I've got her here. You'll see her when you see her. Hold on. Let me, uh, let me pull it up. Uh, here we go. I am going to. Okay. E I mean I see it. Yeah. I see it from that angle, from that angle for sure. Um but isn't it like a cold stuff it's all about the angle? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. like it has to be like uh only from a certain light. But Look isn't this down. woman isn't this woman still alive? She is. But that's some high level stuff right there. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Didn't they, what's they, didn't they confirm in that UFO hearing that cloning is a thing? Okay. Am I, am I crazy here? Uh, I don't know. She does look like, when Taylor Swift gets older, she will look exactly like her. Yeah. Actually. And so, I mean, keep if you just keep going. I mean, through, this is really close. That's what, yeah. But think about high, high, how high level all this spell casting is going on with Taylor Swift. Like, it's just how high level it is, right? It's very high level. There's no doubt about that. And the fact that there is this, you know, the ultimately perfect word uncanny, if you understand what uncanny really means. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. the uncanny mm -hmm. resemblance that's there and then even in the setup in regards of like not you know the the quality is found in the quantity mm. you know i don't know this it's is, all it, i mean it, it's almost irrelevant <laughs> in the sense of like yeah yeah whatever it, we could be like it's a nice little whatever but i mean this taylor swift thing's a thing because he's a small I, g god like I know, I, yeah, I know young women who for have sure. like. I mean, Taylor Swift's the, the tip of the spear that really kind of like started destroying their character, and and this she, isn't like this isn't well, like we've talked okay, about we've talked about Taylor Swift before. Yeah, this and I'm not talking about like I listened to Ozzy and he made me kill myself. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about it's worse. It's actually well, worse than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's actually the. I mean, Ozzy's. You know, if there's something occult going on, it's like it's already exposed, which in a way was like Anton LaVey. This is mm -hmm. way more sinister. Yeah. Because it's supposed to be like wholesome, like well, Taylor Swift. It's is wrapped wholesome. in sacred. It's, right. Exactly. It's candy apples and it's razor blades and candy apples. Which is what yeah. actually makes it evil. Yeah. Yeah. That's why the Beatles are actually worse than the Stones, because the Stones are like, no, we're out. We know. We know yeah, it's right. not the Beatles right. are like, it's all good. Like, don't and, worry. About and, it. and on top of that, they're just actually worse than the Stones anyway.
Hello and welcome to Royal Path. I am your host, Andrew, and tonight I'm going to ask Father and Father Turbo and Cyprian, was there a moment that you guys can recall where you were like, oh, I'm old? Like, oh, <laughs> this is it. This is like not, a lot not of recently. All, all the time. <laughs> sure. What was the first one? The, do you remember, like, the first just- one? turning slightly to the right and I almost just completely lost my balance like a completely <laughs> geriatric old man. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do, That'll it. do it. Yeah. Uh, How old were you? Like last week. Like last week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll do it. I I think one of my first moments was I fell out of a tree and this is actually also what helped me get sober. But I fell out of a tree I was climbing and I landed on my shoulder wrong. Mm. And I was like, that hurts like it never hurt before. And like mm. it like it triggered something in me. I was like, this isn't cute anymore. Like this isn't fun. I'm not in early 20s. No one's following me around with a camera, like filming my crazy antics. Like that part of my life is dead. It's over. Like I'm never going to get in a band. I'm never going to make it big in a band like this. It, it was just this huge moment of like eye opening. I was like. The people I've glorified up till now, it's never going to happen for me. Like, that's just not where well, my that, that, that went very deep just off a of shoulder injury. Man. That's what I'm saying. God knows what he's doing. Because, like, I was trying to be stupid. I was trying to be young. I was a little bit drunk. I was in Lawrence, Kansas, trying to go see a show. And I was waiting for the show. College town. Yeah. And I fell out of a tree trying to climb it. And just a whole bunch of stuff. It, like, the rest of my night sucked. Because I was just like, it's over. Like my youth essentially, quote unquote, is over. And I was like, mm. it's time to move on. It's time to grow up. And, you know, I'm still doing that. But mm. well, yeah. I, I think youth being youth being over is, I think, maybe one thing. And then the other one of like being like, oh, I'm old, I think, is another thing for me, probably. OK, I think I've been like my youth being over. I think that's been a long time. But the. You know what? The I know I'm old or or hey, I'm old is uh, is also an injury. And it was when I got here to Saipan, I noticed that there were uh, volleyball courts out on the beach and I was and like well maintained. And so I was like started asking around like, oh, hey, who plays volleyball? Who plays volleyball? Because I played for years, like in my 30s, you know, I was playing tournaments every weekend, like, you know, ranked and rated in, in California and all of these things. Right. So um. So I got out and played and when I, and I, you know, whatever, a little rusty, but the next day my knee was the size of like a, a watermelon, dude. It was just huge. Oh. And I couldn't move. I couldn't walk on it. I couldn't. And I was like, well, that's it. Because I hadn't even played that hard, you know? Mm. And, and maybe I played for like an hour and a half, maybe. Mm. And I used to play like all day. Mm. In my 30s, I could play all day and then come back and play the next day, all day. And then it was like, I couldn't walk for like two months. <laughs> oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, rehabbed it. I rehabbed it really good. And like now it's pretty good. And I'm in the gym again doing like, you know, deep, deep weighted squats and all kind of stuff like heavy weights. But yeah, that was when I was like, okay, now the whole job is to not get injured. Yeah, that was and and now my my mind is completely. It used to be like, oh man, go hard. Like I would just be like, oh, I'm going so hard, and now it's like, don't hurt yourself, <laughs> don't hurt yourself like that. Yeah. And that was so. I think that's what I knew. So probably about three years ago, three years ago, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sorry, how old are you, Cyprian? I'm 45. Okay, so you're about 42. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I've beat I've beat my body up so bad, dude. Like I really, yeah, I think you and I beat our bodies up in very different ways, and I think yes. like yeah, my true. my injuries now that I live with are more caused from idiocy, like more like just <laughs> stupid stuff, and like potentially potentially my shoulder injury could be from just a stupid drunken fight I was in one time, and like mm-hmm, where sure. the dude just kind of took it too far, and we were playing around. Mm-hmm. 
and just took it too far. And now I have this like thing I got to constantly live with. So, well, youth, I, I think that youth is marked by the underlying feeling of invincibility, which is where my mm, um, yeah. and and immortality right? Which is where mm. my injuries also come from, like not in the same way, but just that like training in ways that I like that were like not enough warm up, not enough sure. stretching, not all the things that I knew that I should do, all the things that like the experienced older guys who were around me and mentors of mine were like, dude, please do this. Please do this. And I was like, ah, I don't need to do it. You know, come to find out that now I'm that guy. Yeah. And the reason that I'm saying please do it is because I'm like, look, I'm bearing the injuries. Please do it so that you're not bearing the same injuries as me. And that's such a weird experience to know, like, oh, that's why those guys said it. Wow. And that's just that's just gonna continue to purpose like purpose mm -hmm. like uh it's just being a cycle over and over mm -hmm. and over of course. again. Because like the youth, you know, they'll they, well, you know, youth I, is wasted on the young. Yeah. And I think that's say that that's, again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Except for some of our teens at St. Mary's, I'd say they're utilizing their youth well. I think like a that's couple good. of the teens have got like, no, they're doing some stuff. Like they're like, they're not wasting all their time like going out and doing dumb stuff. Like they're like, they're in church. Like they're being respectful. They're like listening to their mother. And, you know, they're trying hard. And um I I I actually was like, I was actually, this is one of the things I was actually just thinking about not too long ago. I was like, you know, um, I don't dive too far down this hole, but like, there was so much about like one, an authority figure would tell me, mm -hmm. no, you need to listen to me and be like, why? Mm -hmm. You don't like, just you about don't, to, to mention yeah, this. Yeah. You don't have, I, you don't have anything I want. There's like, there's nothing that you have that I want. Like, I don't know why I would ask your advice for stuff. Because, like, if anything, just to gauge what to stay away from. Because, like, up mm -hmm. until I met my first spiritual father, really, I hadn't met, and I didn't realize this until later, I hadn't met anybody that I, like, genuinely respected. That, like, when they walked mm -hmm. in the room, I folded my hands and had my, had, like, held my head down. And when they would walk up and tell me something, even if it was irrational, I'd go, yes, sir, or yes, father, and then go and do it. I never had that before. Like I was a punk to my dad and a punk to my mom. So like, um, you know, so what, what difference would there have been if I had been Orthodox as a teen, but I try not to go down that well too far, that hole too far. Cause why ain't nothing but a crooked letter can't be made straight. So dude, it's such a big, it's such a big deal. This idea, because I was, I had the reputation in my youth as like my teens. I was talking, I was, just talking with the brothers here about that. Uh, you know, I caused a lot of problems when I was in school, kicked out of schools and things like that, just because I hadn't, it was like the, no respect for authority, but exactly like you said, like I had no respect for those people claiming authority where to me, I could see like there, what, how are you claiming this authority? But there were a few people, mentors, coaches, one or two teachers that I had that I had no problem being obedient. None. No, I, and I never, and the thing is, I never have. If if I'm looking at this person, and like you say, I'm looking and I'm like, oh, you have something, like what you have is what I want. Where you are is where I want to be. Who you are is who I want to be, right? And I've never had a problem in that regard. And I wonder if there are, just aren't, if that's really just not the problem. Well, I think, I think like, um, I call it, what saint is it? Saint, someone was asking the saint, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I cannot remember who it was, but it's like, why are there no good spiritual fathers? Mm. Like, Cause there are no good spiritual children. Like, yeah. like, and like, I, you know, at, at some extent, like, or to some extent, yeah, we, I think you guys probably have a lot more insight to this than I do. And I'm kind of just going off the cuff, but like, I mean, at what point was like the next generation a, a, in America in the last hundred years is what I'm comfortable mm -hmm. talking about. Cause there's like writings from Greece, like sure. 6,000 years ago, They're like the next generation is going to be the end of us or whatever, you know, <laughs> like there's no way we're going to make it past this next generation. But like in the last hundred years or so, what generation was really just like, just awful. 
I mean, I, I'm tempted to say boomers, but I have no idea. You know, no. I really don't know. Uh, boomers weren't boomers weren't awful. No, no. no boomers, I mean, boomers definitely made mistakes and a lot of the decay of our country and society. Dude, I think the answer is millennials. Is, is the boomers, <laughs> but yeah, millennials. I mean, millennials, I, I don't even care. I don't care if it's cliche. I, I'm going to go hard in the paint on this one. Like, it's it's millennials. I mean, I... I'm ready. Someone wants to do this. We'll have a nice debate. I'll gladly debate you on it. Um, and you may say everything I'm going to say is anecdotal, but I'm just telling you, like, objectively, millennials, like, we open the door for a lot of degeneracy. Well, but the thing is, Zoomers aren't just, that bad. Yeah. Zoomers aren't like the Gen Gen Z is yeah. not bad at all. Yeah, it's 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 not even. Yeah, there's there's this thing with the millennials, and they had they're kind of like the easy target to beat up. But I mean, there's a reason. There's, it's this perfect storm of all of these very poor spirit, like just an absolute, not even an absence of of character, of character, especially in a spiritual sense, but like things are antithetical to yeah. like spirituality yeah. and yeah. character. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, and of course. Is it because they're raised? Uh-oh. That was me. That was me. Is it, be, is it because they were raised on the internet? Is that what it is? I don't know. The millennials are the first generation raised on the mean, internet. I don't. I don't feel comfortable with that. I, I don't. I mean, I think it might be. I think it's that two paths like converge on X Y axis and just hit this like perfect like perfect level of like your basic needs being taken care of, so you have nothing mm -hmm, to do but mm -hmm, think. Mm -hmm. yep. Post modernism or post 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 whatever we're on like the sixth mm -hmm. or seventh post modernism mm -hmm. iteration of post modernism access to like the internet and technology like just let alone like the unregulated and unending access to porn i, mean, alone. It's spoiled. I, I mean, think that in and of it i think yeah. that may be the answer yeah, that I mean, may be the answer they are they are and i mean when you think of a millennial for, for me mm -hmm. and of course if you're a millennial and you're uh and you get a pass on this one then fine you get a pass and then you shouldn't mm -hmm. be upset Mm -hmm. And if anything, you should be agreeing with us. So if you're like, that's not me, God bless you. Then, you know, you know exactly what we're talking about. But millennials, they are like the, they are the definition, the epitome of spoiled. I think mm -hmm. that's, I think that is the thing. Everything, mm -hmm. I mean, they are spoiled. They are entitled. And of course, these are all generalizations. There's great, you know, but American millennials, how's that? Does that make everyone feel better? American millennials on the whole even the ones that are good, which I have found, mm -hmm. they still have these deep blemishes from their generation that they have to work extra hard at mm -hmm. to to deal with. You know, it's a it's it's tough. It's really tough. It's really, yeah. really tough. Right. There's a lot of self love wrapped up in it too. It's, it's I mean, like, that's that's the thing of being spoiled. Spoiled no. is self love, entitled. I mean, all of the things. You know what I mean? Um and all that stuff that you mentioned, the the porn, the access to internet, the not, not having any real problems. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just a it's just, it's just this crazy amount of abundance, and with with the lack of an existential threat. Because yeah. I mean, every other generation that's like Gen Xers, and I'm on the the far end of Gen X, but I'm still in the Gen X. Like we had the Cold War and the threat of nuclear mm -hmm. annihilation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that was real. I remember as a kid and I'm not alone. I'm sure father, this is probably something for you at some point in your life too. I remember as a, a kid, the age of my young children going to bed, like interrogating my parents about, okay, so what do we do if there's a new, if, if, if a nuclear well, we bomb did, drops? We did, we did drills in school, dude. I did nuclear war drills in school. That's what I'm saying. You know what I mean, <laughs> like, I did little nuclear war drills. But see, it goes in beyond that because depending on where you're at, I mean, the the riots. You riots. know what I mean? Like yep. the LA, LA riots. riots. Yeah. Like wow. I mean, 9/11. We were 9/11. Going... You know what I mean? The crack epidemic. Like there were so mm -hmm. many things that even if you weren't in South Central mm -hmm. or New York or like Detroit, some place like that, you still kind of like ooh, you know, like. There was this edge, and not not in an edge lord kind of way. It's like there was an edge to like life at that time. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and there was this 
And whether it's propaganda, like whatever it was used for, it was still in our psyche. And mm -hmm. on top of that, there was a lot of um, having to deal with, you know, like real issues in regards of how we were, the world we were encountering, right? Because again, like I don't, you know, I'm I'm not pro everything that happened during those generations, but a lot of it were these like responses to like, you know, real questions and issues and, and problems. And, and like for the millennials, so all that was solved for them. Yeah. So that all that was left was not even like real angst. It was, I mean, it was angst in its pure sense. It was just like, it's like, have you guys read Brave New World? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You remember that? Isn't there like, I read it once in like 2020, I think like 2021. Mm -hmm. And there's that part. So I, I don't remember. Were they like going like a safari to mm -hmm. see suffering? Like, you know what I mean? They like go on a safari to see like the primitives or whatever. But it's like this whole like, yeah, well, the we savages, can, the, the savages, savage, but we can get mm -hmm. out at any time. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel like millennials have this like unconscious belief of like, if things mm -hmm. get too difficult, I can get out at any time. So it's yeah, almost that, that, like, yeah, that's weird. You're <laughs> almost it's almost like you're a tourist. It's almost like you're a tourist in life and you're not and you understand these concepts that like life is supposed to be difficult. But you're kind of also as an American, you're kind of mm -hmm. also told it's not really that way anymore. And really, like you your difficulty will be more along the lines of so we couldn't find we like to quote tyler durden whatever mm -hmm. we had no great war we had no great crisis we had nothing well we had a spiritual war so i think the way that that might have manifested itself is like the whole like the quote like the struggle is real just the whole like getting through your day while trying to like get the like euphoria you're entitled to i guess is like mm -hmm. a way of putting it is this like that in and of itself is so difficult you now have a, a right to complain like everyone else does mm -hmm. but also at the same time it's like what father said like if we're gonna do prisons let's do prisons let's not have like a middle wishy-washy thing it's like no if life is going to be difficult then have it actually be difficult to the point where you like actually find some real like repentance. Well, here's the thing. Like, here's the thing. So a common thing, which is really particular to millennials is, and that's where, that's why we're at, where we're at in regards to the absurdity and the lunacy is I don't have that thing to struggle with. So let me create one, create one. There like, it is. Let, let me be, let me create a victim narrative. Yep. And that's like, let me, let me search and find some sort of disorder that I need to have mm -hmm. or search and find some way that I can align myself and identify as a marginalized person in some way. Right. A, a that, friend of mine calls it everybody's own personal march on Selma. Yeah. 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 I mean that, but with all this being said, I just want to say this because of the nature of this millennials do probably have it the hardest. Because mm -hmm. every generation has something that they can pull from in a real way and be like, let me work with right. this. Right. And they got nothing. They got right. like, they got no real, that I, I'm sure if we work real hard, we can find one. They don't got any real um, good, inherent spiritual characteristics or traits. They're at, they're at not even a zero, they're at a negative. Yeah. So when you find a millennial that's actually trying to, to find true repentance, um, and one that isn't just like wanting to feel better, because that's the problem. Millennials are just tempted with just mm. everything's about feeling better. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard for them to enter into repentance. So if they get this idea of repentance, and repentance isn't just about you feeling better, then what can happen is then they can actually become holy pretty quick. Because mm. the the reality of, of they, if they can get a hold of repenting for a generation, if they can get a hold of like, I got to own this and I, and I got to own this because it's baked in me and no one else can like, it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. It, it doesn't matter if anyone else sees it, I see it. And I'm going to have the courage to repent of it. If you got a millennial who, who's doing that and I know a millennial too, who are doing that, they, they can, someone can be on their way to legit becoming holy. 
But that is really, really tough because for most millennials, it's it's always somebody else's fault. And it's just, it's all those things which they just, it's been baked into them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's real tough. Their, their spiritual pain threshold is very low. Oh. it well, Yeah. Because we're low, just raised to believe that like real pain is a thing of the past. Like you don't really need right. it. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's, it's an artifact. It's an artifact. Yeah. And like, I've been really into this thing about like, and I think I've talked about this, so I won't go on, but of like, um, I'm doing the very thing that father just talked about how people shouldn't do, but I'm going to do it. But like, I've been really into this idea of like, like not air conditioning. Like, and I've, I've done it these last couple of weeks mm-hmm. because it's been really hot in Missouri. But like before that, mm-hmm. it's like, no, I'd like to feel like what it was like before this was even an option. Like, and people back then, like, so there's like these footage, like these, um, of like the 1920s, like New York, but like the footage is restored and then like through whatever AI demon, they like color it and put in sound and yes, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like, you're actually walking sure. down the street in 1920s, sure. New York or something. It's probably hot, but nobody's mm-hmm. wearing shorts. Like, and nobody's wearing a short sleeve shirt. Like, maybe mm-hmm. on the beach you are. Mm-hmm. But, like, if you're walking down Wall Street in the 1920s and it looks hot, everyone is still dressed. Mm-hmm. Three-piece suit. You know, I think I, I think it's a three-piece suit. I mean, it's a vest. It's a coat. It's a shirt. And, then, mm-hmm. and like, that, those materials aren't probably light or breathable. Like, they are sweating. It's difficult. Oh, and there's no deodorant, by the way. And there's, and there's no deodorant. And uh, there's a fair amount of like historical events of like teeth pain was a thing. Like a sure. lot of people yep. had a massive amount of teeth pain yep. because, you know, uh, sugar yep. was yep. plentiful at the time. And so it's like, how do I get back to that? Or do it's you like, you want to get back to that? I want to know what drives a man. And I still see them mm-hmm. in Kansas City. And, you know, j- just generalize. Generally, it's a black man in a mm-hmm. very nice suit selling mm-hmm. rhubarb pies on the side of the road just for like for like 10 bucks and the heat is just pounding down and the oh, dude like is nation still... of islam guys like selling bean pies no it's like some southern baptist oh, church okay. or something okay, like okay, that okay. and like it's because it's missouri it's got that like okay. wonderful Fair like enough. southern church feel to it a little bit but like these dudes are out there just beads of sweat but like they're not taking off their jacket like there's no taking off the jacket i'm like what what frame of mind are you in where you could just take off the thing, but you don't do that because there's some something and very important and truthful about you doing that. There's something very important that I don't know what it is. It's just like willingness to like, no, I'm not going to do this to make myself more comfortable. Well, it's a mortification of the flesh. Yeah. It's, a, it's asceticism. Yeah. It's like wearing a hair yeah. shirt. Or that's a what it is. every day. Yeah, that's <laughs> what it is. So that's, that's exactly what I'm it is. Com- I'm comfortable with saying the cassock is asceticism. I'm I'm comfortable with that. But for me, this what, feels... what's wait? But why why are you comfortable with that? But you're not well, comfortable. Maybe I mean, it's because... a it's cloth around you that's but making you hot. Maybe it's because it's in an orthodox context. Father's a priest. He wears a cassock, and so I'm more comfortable. But to me. It says something. Okay, so maybe these things are connected in a way I'm not realizing. But here's the me, thing: we don't have like the market on asceticism. No, every, no. Every, it, it didn't even start Friday. with orthodoxy. Yeah, I mean, it, that it's... was one of the first reasons I got into black metal is because those dudes were purposely making themselves incredibly uncomfortable all the time. Yeah, so no. I mean, and yeah. let's just be clear: like the thing that is uniquely orthodox about our asceticism that is that it's not asceticism for asceticism's sake. Which that's is... the difference. Which we talked about with the Amish. That's, before. that's, like, that's the different, yeah. right? So, you know, I just think. No, I think it's something about being. A I think that, I, mean, I just say this. I think the thing is to kind of look at this is not like why did like. So, it's not so much why did or how did other past generations do it. It's like what was lost because that's how everyone's yeah. done it. Except that's what I'm. That's, that's what, the so. Thing. How that come was lost. how come it's okay to suddenly show up to work in a t-shirt? Yeah, because you know what I mean? every, because there's no respect. There's no there's no humility. There's no sense of dignity. Everything is jaded. Everything is post nihilistic. You know? There's well, and no- nobody's te- well, really what it is is nobody's they if they showed up in a t-shirt, nobody's sending them home and shaming them. Right. Right. 
And if they do, then they're going to get a whole thing of like, that's the oh, you yelled at me. Yep. Oh, you're going to get put I on TikTok as a, as a bad boss or whatever. Well, no, yeah, you might get fired. You yeah. as the boss who tells yeah, the, the person, person to exactly. show up in the, the person, T-shirt. Yep. The you might get fired and sued. Yeah, because <laughs> the person who says, hey, listen, you have to wear the uniform and you can't go to the bathroom, have a bowel movement, not wash your hands, then handle the food. Like, you just can't do that. What? What do you mean? How right. dare you? You never cared about me. Like, yeah. the, like blah, 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 blah. And then the and whole they have thing some thing. sort of so- social anxiety disorder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have OCD. Yeah. This is yeah. killing my OCD. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's good. And I in can't order for me to this. feel <laughs> I, in order for me to feel comfortable, I have to be listening to Taylor Swift all the time in one yeah. ear. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I because have to be doing is, that. Because, because the thing is, and I think this is the thing is that it's it's all about the self like that that's one of the things of like look we've talked about it before it's like one of the things that's really missing and again if you're if this isn't you god bless you super millennial um why why is there a real absence of of genuine true subculture as it's existed in the past right right. because there's no sense of like a greater scene there's no sense of like the greater collective in that sense right because all that started to get burned out with Tom's shoes and like all the things. Because mm-hmm. cause that right there takes that idea of a scene, takes that idea of something higher, you know, in regards of a collective. And it turns it ultimately into my own personal, like, uh, my own personal charity. It's still about me and what I'm doing. You know, and what it's I'm commodified. It's commodified. You just buy still, it. It's all about me. Right. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. I, I see, I think that's the thing is. You see all this because there's an inherent me and it's a real sickness. You know, I, I, I it's hard. It's like, oh, you know, you, people can sense the disgust. But I, underneath all that for me is a real pity. It's real oh, pity sure. because like I, I feel sorry for these people who, you know, have been. It's like a whole generation being born like they're like spiritual thalamide babies. Mm-hmm. You, could you expand on that? Expand on that. What's okay. thalamite? So th- 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 thalidomide, thalidomide. Yeah, excuse me, thalidomide. Yeah. So thalidomide was a. Um, I can't remember if it was an ingredient or it was the birth control no. that was used. No, no, no. It was a fertility medicine. Was it fertility? I thought it was birth control. I, I th- I'm, I'll look it up, but I th- I'm pretty up. sure it was a fertility drug that they were trying. But I'll. Yeah, I'm also not thalidomide. Uh, thalidomide. Okay. Don't lose that point, Father. I want to understand what you're trying to say. Uh, an oral medication used to treat a number of cancers. Oh, weird. Okay, hold on. Let me let me look it up. Maybe that's what it's okay. What a twist! And then pull up a picture. Uh, show what a thalidomide baby looks like. And many skin disorders. It's been used in a number of HIV things. Thalidomide was first marketed in West Germany, where it was available over the counter. When first released, thalidomide, oh, for morning sickness, for morning anxiety, sickness. sleeping, yeah. tension, but particularly, it was the morning sickness. Yeah, and you had the, something to do with pregnancy. Yes, 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 yes. And it had something okay. to do with pregnancy. Let me, let me do some uh, thalidomide, thalidomide. And so... Do, I'll do images here. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, so we could see... I mean, I don't know how long we want to look at these images because it's pretty tragic. But uh, I'm just find one with like an adult one. Try like an oh, adult. This, this this woman, it looks like. Oh, I just went too. There was a there was a comic like book. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Arms and like, legs. It would it would yeah. really damage the. So you wound the up with arms. like. Yeah, really like, deformed arms and legs, basically, yeah. is what it came down. Like the rest, was, pretty normal. That's very normal. Like yeah. there was, there's a comic book. It's a real interesting one called Skin, mm. and it was about a skinhead, a young skinhead, uh, that was a thalidomide baby. Oh, interesting. And so he was a skinhead. He got the boots and the braces, and and but he didn't have arms. You know what I mean? Whoa. And so, mm. anyways. It's like a whole generation of people. You have a whole generation of these thalidomide babies. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's just like, like it's not their fault. You know what I'm saying? But it's their responsibility to do something with it. Because like, 
if you're born like that, you can sit there and whine and complain all day about like how unfair it is. And we're but, doing that. But yeah, but you're either going to choose to to get on with your life and make up with what you got or not. And I think that's another key thing about millennials is like so many of them choose not to do that, which is that's where the need for repentance. So many of them choose not to actually just take responsibility. Mm -hmm. right? And this, they need to understand, okay, sure. It's not your fault. No problem. It is your responsibility, though, and that refusal to take responsibility is is really where the tragedy lies, and it's you know there needs to be real repentance. But from I think I think at the end of the day, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do is go back and find the thing that we lost. And I know we just touched on what that thing is, but like like imbibing that spirit again of like no wait it's what is what is it? Because I'm not even sure. Like, it's, what is it's, it that was was that was lost? I think it's just being a person. It's just being mm. a human being because I think so much of like the instead of like a consuming or yeah. an avatar or a social media avatar. I think yeah. like like the programming goes deep, but like there's like I know one of the main problems with addicts and alcoholics is we don't want to be human. We don't want to be subject to the everyday mm. pain and drudgery and misery of life. Mm. You know, we don't want to be doing that. We want to be skirting the surface of that stuff. We want to be able to touch it so that we can say that we're human and that we're feeling it, which is, I think, one of the reasons why crying is such a thing now. People cry, you know, they'll like, but it's not good tears. They'll cry because they'll like feel validated because finally there's like a mm. trans Barbie doll or something like that. I have no idea. So they're like, they're crying. So they're saying, no, I'm feeling genuine human emotions. It means I am a human being. But, they're they're not, but when, see, but when see, they're crying, they're crying in a video on social media. That's what I'm saying. Crying, yeah, or they're crying for yeah. real. Because like <laughs> we've yeah. been we've been yeah. being programmed for a little while to want to be able to accept like, it, no, I'm OK with about 20 percent of life. This is really key because this is why it's so hard for people. That's why you talk about this. It's like I'm just telling you, there's just this whole level. It all, it's always been this way. I mean, it was this way for me. It's there. It's this way for everybody. Mm -hmm. But there's this whole thing of just, it's really tough to get into, you know, the heart of the tradition of actually becoming Orthodox, not just kind mm -hmm. of like hooking up to the right, you know, the, the non-woke, like whatever thing. Mm -hmm. Because this whole thing here, this is at the heart of it. And this is where a lot of people are going to get lost. There's a lot of people that jump on and whatever. And like, okay, you'll get weeded out because... The first time you run, you run across a priest who you like and he says something that doesn't fit your political quota, you can't handle it. Okay, boom. Someone, you know, you lose a couple of people there. But then there's this other thing where it's just like, are you really facing yourself? And this is where so many people just in general, especially millennials, are just you better buckle up. Because when you face yourself, the crocodile tears and the like, this is so ingrained in the tradition if you are seeking comfort, you cannot make it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you can't truly be orthodox and, and find the path to salvation and be and want comfort comfort. This isn't kind of like, well, that's just the monastics. This isn't just like, well, I just I'm just that is that's the cross. That's all the way through. And so this giving over to emotions, man, I mean, it's so demonic. Because it's all about making someone a shadow and a shell of what it means to be human. That's and I think people are getting more and more comfortable with that. They're just like they they are very, very picky about like what emotions they're willing to endure. Like there is no It has to be self serving. It can't be authentic. It it's has like, to be self self serving in some way. And that's the key because the that's where the devil tempts people. Cause it, it just, it, that whole like, oh, this is going to validate. Like my only sense of feeling real is like pain. And this is, this is the whole thing because the psychological pain, it's real tempting. People can get into stuff and man, they'll read Sophroni. They'll just think, oh yeah, pain, pain, pain. It's like, no, 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 no. Well, you're into is pathological. What you're yeah. into is just like, yeah, you're broken. You have a broken, I mean, we talked about this recently, broken sick psyche. That's not what repentance is and it's it's super important because uh, the temptations and then the way that people get tempted into this it isn't just an individualistic thing again it's the culture it's the generation i mean god it's, help us it's, i 
so often, and I was this way, but so often I, I I'll talk with people about like the cross and, you know, they have little to no reference to orthodoxy or whatever. And I'll say like, you know, oh, like the, the salvific redemptive aspect of suffering. And they're like, oh, I know. I'm like, do you? I mean, like, do you? I mean, like, I barely know. And I have right. like a lot more tools than you do. And like, again, that doesn't make me better than, doesn't make me, no, I'm not better than you. I literally have the whole toolbox sitting in front of me. You're working with like an old broken hammer and like mm -hmm. three busted nails. And like, and like, I barely get this concept of like, no, voluntarily choosing suffering, like voluntarily being like, no. And with joy saying, no, I have two options. And one of these is less comfortable. Let's do that one. And well, it's this like, is the, this is, you said the word, right? Like, like, cause I think people get confused like pain, suffering, and discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that what we're really talking about is like a, that culturally or generationally, there's no, there isn't an appreciation for discomfort in the way that it seems like it was definitely in my own generation, right? Is that like, we were, it, we were actively pushing ourselves into un, like, into uncomfortable situations it was almost like we would compete not pain not injury right not even necessarily things that hurt but it kind of gets down to like you you talking about this dude in the who's wearing like the the coat right and you're like you're seeing him and there's all this sweat on him and it's like sweat doesn't hurt sweating doesn't hurt <laughs> it's not the most comfortable thing because you're wet as opposed to dry. You're maybe a little hotter than you normally would be, but he's not passing out on the side of the road. No. He's not having heat stroke, right? It's just relative discomfort compared to, well, why isn't he just sitting in a building with the, with the fan on him or something like that? That's yeah. that softness. I mean, softness. It, it's softness exactly. and, and it's everywhere. I mean, look, how do we promote the military? Oh, I got two moms. You know what I mean? Uh, how are we promoting our military now? It's like whatever issue, you know, whatever, again, yeah, whatever. That's the logical progression right there. Yep. Yeah. Whatever diagnosis you got, man, like we're just going to make sure that we appease that. Okay. Like that's, that is the evidence. It's that softness, which is incompatible. Right. So. It's, know. I don't know. It's, I, I think. I think there's something to be said. It would be like this, and then we can move on after this. And two, um, we've touched on it a couple of times. We actually have a subject matter tonight. But I think it's like at the end of the day, it's like the security guard who chooses to stand rather than sit. You're like, you know, like he's working his station or let's be progressive. They are the woman or the man are working the station, whatever. And they're sitting there and there's every opportunity for them to have a chair. They could go get a chair. There's a chair right over there, but they choose to stand like they choose to kind of walk around and take a look instead of what I see almost every security guard do. Not, not all, but almost everyone stand there on their phone, just like sitting there, like leaning against something, just sitting there, just scrolling Facebook or something. It's just like and like I think that's really like a big thing is. um is like how often people are looking at their phones. And I, this, we've talked about this. We've talked about the death, you know, but it's like this. Well, whole, it's again, a dopamine addiction. And that's, that's what I tell everyone. It's like at the end of the day, you're not addicted to the alcohol. You're not addicted to the drugs. You're addicted to the dopamine. And like, yeah. the problem is, is there's more than one way to get dopamine and you're going to find it in sobriety. So don't think that yeah. like five years in and you're still hooking up with chicks on Tinder or whatever like that, that yep. you're in some kind of real recovery. You're not. That's not real recovery. You're still addicted to your dopamine. You're still doing your thing. I've talked this to death, so we won't do this anymore. But I think something that would be very good to shift to now is because father is very specific about what we wanted to talk about. And I think mm -hmm. it's, of course, ties in, but temptation, like this idea of temptation, this whole like the whispering in the ear. You know, of like, you know, is that really, do you really have to do it that much? Do you really have to say your whole prayer rule tonight? Or can you just, God knows your heart and like, don't worry about it and stuff like that. So um, I don't know how you wanted to approach this father, but like, well, can we, can we start and can we start here? Because there was something interesting on that note, Andrew, because it's, I think it's relevant on that note. 
um, something that I saw Father Peter here is talking about uh, baptism recently, and I know that there's been a lot of controversy over this recent book and all of this, but him talking about um, before baptism that the enemy can is actually like inside speaking inside. in a way, right? Yeah. And then after baptism and chrismation, the enemy can tempt, but external. can only tempt from the external. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if we could start there, because it's I think that that's a good like framing. Cyprian? I don't like paying compliments. That's a really good place to start because that is actually a really, really good, because this is a concept that I think is fascinating. I think it's absolutely, I, I do too. Like That's the flip, I want to talk about it. how things happen, <laughs> like just one of the many things that happen to a person after they're baptized. Mm -hmm. So go father. So <laughs> by the way, I have your review of that book by Peter. Here's like screenshot it. And you best believe I'm going to be using it at some point. Like your All review right. of father, Peter, here's his book. The reception of the orthodox or the heterodox mm -hmm. oh yeah. oh great i mean i can yeah. is it the full thing or just a snippet just a snippet I but it's like you and you're like and then there's like a like a thing and i'm like i'm gonna bust that out at some point um i mean the first thing that's really important and you know let's just talk about it right um baptism and what is baptism you know and so the thing is, is just to make it really, really simple on some points. Um, I don't want to get too lost in this, but it, it, it comes with it because part of the reason why we're here is because there's been a temptation that many have succumbed to, right? Um, and it's this temptation to relegate the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ to a category of um, it's, I mean, really a very insidious kind of Protestantism in regards of like taking and picking and choosing. And it all has to do with ecumenism because ultimately people don't want to offend. So it's like you have two pieces. Why? Here's a question. Why is baptism important? So then you have, on the one hand, someone's like, well, like what is baptism? Right. And then, then the question then becomes, why are some people fighting against baptism? Hmm. And people are fighting against baptism, right? Um, and what does that mean? It means there's a whole, not a small section of quote-unquote orthodox authorities that are, you know, all but forbidding baptism. Why? Right? If you really, 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 really break it down, it's why would you forbid baptism? Right. Is the thought, oh, because the idea is like, well, someone was baptized, but like, what is baptism? Right. And if you don't understand what baptism is or you don't believe what the te church teaches about what baptism is, then that's a completely different situation, which leads us to why is baptism important and what, what is it? Well, the rite of baptism includes first and foremost, literally in that order, exorcisms. And you have the people, which is, this is a good majority of the people. They may not say it, but at the end of the day, they think that exorcisms are just an antiquated kind of nice, you know, ritual, right? But we don't need to do that anymore. Um, and they don't even really believe in demons anyway. Right, you know, like psychological or whatever. Yeah, it's it's all a projection of man's, you know, unfulfilled desires. You know, they 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 rather listen to Young than Saint John Chrysostom. Yeah. So, this is the key thing, right? And it doesn't really matter what argument people make, because they'll say, "No, no, no," because it's done in Christ. And who are you to say you don't know where Christ is working? Christ isn't working. Okay. Then, if you if that's your argument then why is it that from time and memoriam we've had the exorcisms? And why is it now and only in recent time that what you think you're enlightened now and that you know better than the fathers? If I remember correctly, the scriptures, the pastoral epistles and the church fathers and the general consensus of the church is that things are getting worse, not better. Amen. Things are not improving in regards of people's piety and phronema and all those things, Right. So the baptism is performed because we are born into sin, right? 
They're born into it, right? Psalm 50, right? I was in, you know, born in sin, in sin to my mother conceived me, right? Iniquity to my mother, my mother conceived me, right? This sin, not guilt, right? Not guilt, but sin and the effects of sin, which we all inherit, right? Also facilitates a, if you want to look at it this way, predisposition for forces that are outside of God's blessing to operate within us. Mm. Right? Mm. Outside of God's blessing, what does that mean? Rebellious forces that are outside of God's blessing, that have left the blessing of God, right? And choose to um, capitalize on available <laughs> vessels, right? So that's a, that's a real thing, right? And that movement from within, it isn't so much that it's just like every person's possessed, but rather every person is not regenerated yet. Baptism is about regeneration. And so that's a huge part of this is that it's for regeneration, the remission of sins, right? You are actually regenerated and your sins are dealt with and you're cleansed in a real, in a real way. And people don't believe that, right? And mm -hmm. so they see it as just, a, 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 again, a Protestant view of just like, it's just about the outward sign, right? That's, that's the core of all this. And so when you understand that, the, 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 the cleansing of the sin through essentially, you know, it, wrote, it says Romans 6 about how we're dead and buried with him, right? We go into the tomb with Christ and our Lord our Lord commands that we be baptized, right? It's not an option. It Lord yeah. commands that we be baptized. And that baptism is for the remission of sins, <laughs> right? And if it isn't the baptism according to what the church does and says, then what is it? Right? Because at the, I mean, we can get into the whole thing and there's the book, which is great. But I, I just, all we have to do is just say, oh, there's no exorcisms. That alone right there tells you everything. That alone, yep. that alone right there tells you everything. So anyways, that movement of being regenerated so that the house can be come clean because what comes after baptism? Always. Chrismation. Right. And what is chrismation? Right? Sealing. The sealing of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Sealing. So, so sealing the, gift. Yeah. the potential, the ability for the fallen forces to work inwardly due to the unregenerated, unregenerated nature of the soul of the human being that becomes flipped because now that that regenerated soul is made clean, it's now made a suitable vessel by which the Holy Spirit can come and reside. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit's working on the outside of a person. Holy Spirit's working with everybody on the outside. I've talked about this before at length, and I always mention the most horrible people to prove the point. The child molester, the transgender, the Satanist, right? Uh, the millennial. <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah. the Holy Spirit's working. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. The Holy Spirit. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's working external to everybody. And then with baptism. So prior to baptism, the, the evil forces can it's not it's not a fundamental but can work from within right and the the soul is unregenerated right um and so the the ancestral sin is is ingrained right baptism that spirit if it's there and its influences are now cast out and the holy spirit is brought in and instead of the holy spirit working on the ex on the outside externally it starts working internally Right. So mm -hmm. all those very wonderful evangelicals and Catholics, and I'm going to say this and, and, you know, let's see if anyone, everyone, it's all good, but the evangelicals, the Catholics, oh man, it's going to get tough. The Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the pagans, um, <laughs> the Satanists, right? Transgender, all those people. Okay. Right? He'll come back. Yeah, I'm listening. 
all those people are being worked on from the outside by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's trying to draw all of them, right? But those who come into the church and who have kept the commandments and the sacrament of baptism and chrismation as the church has received it from the Holy Spirit, those people alone enter into the fullness of this life, right? This this church life, right, that we're speaking of. And that, and that has nothing to do with, like, what's fair, what's not fair, what's nice, what's not nice. It's just that's, that's what it is. And if something happens to where that's not the case, God's going to work it out. Because we're not going to sit here and talk about the pygmy in Borneo who never heard about Christ. Christ knows how to work with that. We're not, not saying anything. But if you can hear this, then you've had your opportunity. And if you're mad about it, you need to repent because it's not, it's not me. It's not Father Peter hears. It's not whoever you want to point the fingers at. You got to take it up with the with the fathers of the church, both modern and ancient, and you got to take it up with Christ because that's what gonna, Christ taught. You're gonna right? lose. Yeah, you're gonna lose. Like I don't know if we're called to emulate his life. He began his ministry with a baptism. So I mean, I mean, like the baptism he sorry. to fulfill all righteousness, right? It's like, oh, you're better than Christ. <laughs> Man, that's rich. So um, think better than Christ. Didn't you have a story about um a Catholic who has not read the exorcism prayers and then uh first hand experience threw up his communion? First hand, first hand experience, yeah. And so I mean it's yeah. So this this working and, and think about what the Lord taught about when the house is ex- when a fallen spirit, an unclean spirit is expelled from the house. It leaves the house. It goes to the dry places where the other fallen spirits dwell. It comes back after a short while to the house that it was expelled from, looks and finds that the house is unoccupied, meaning that that person is not working with the sacrament that they've been given of the Holy Spirit, right? And then the spirit, that fallen spirit decides to go back and find seven more spirits more wicked than itself. It comes back and indwells that house. That has everything to do with what we're talking about, Right. So I think when we understand this, then we can begin to really see like the nature of not just how temptations work, but even to how we can navigate like, well, what are temptations really, you know, because this is the thing that temptations in um, the reading today, um, the gospel today out of Matthew, when is Matthew 18, when the Lord says um, that temptations must come. Um, but woe unto the man by who the temptations come through, or to that effect. Um, and that is like a whole thing, right? Um, because the temptations... Um, were you looking at the scripture? I am. Yeah. Um, it's like 18. What is it? Yeah. So it's 18, one through 11. And at first Christ discusses who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then unless you become like a child. Um, and then whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, be better for a millstone hung around his neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. Uh, woe, to the, uh, woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man that by whom the offense comes. So um, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better that you enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. So not to cut off the word, the, the, the master's words, but um, I think you were referencing that part in the middle that he was talking about that woe to those who buy that temptation comes or that sin comes. Yeah. Yeah. So temptation. So Judas. So like essentially yeah. Judas. Yeah. Judas. And the thing that is important to understand here is like, you know, temptations, have to come to this world. Um, they're they're an unfortunate reality and to some degree a necessity because of this world. What is this world? This world is composed of people, right? That's what makes the world up is people. What are people? People are, you know, these free souls, right? These these beings that have been endowed with a with a free soul, right? Um, and that freedom uh, necessitates the reality of temptation, right? Yeah. 
because the temptation is the influence of the evil one. But as a temptation, you're tempted when you're when you are being drawn away from truth. That's always the temptation. No matter like when you think of temptation, it's like there's a choice I have to make. And I'm either choosing the path of Christ or I'm choosing not. You know, the flesh, the devil, the world, whatever. That's what the temptation is. Right? Now, the thing that's really powerful and interesting is that for the child of God, that temptation, once they endure it for the sake of Christ, that temptation now turns into testing. Mm. Right? Because God doesn't tempt. He allows temptations to come, but he doesn't tempt, but he does test. Right? And the difference is temptations are always for the fall. Temptations are always there to set up a fall to facilitate a fall, to bring about some sort of deviation from the will of God. But a testing is all about that person or that item being able to withstand the necessary pressures for it to be what it was intended to be. Think about the sword that's being forged. It needs to be tested to see if it's going to hold its edge, right? So it's all about the intention. It can look very similar, but they're like worlds apart in regard because of the intention versus tempting and testing. Now, the thing about the, the tempting and woe well into the man by whom temptation comes is you become a portal to hell. So mm. we all need to be tempted, right? We all need to be tempted because that tempting, like St. Joseph talks about, is that's the way in which we are either made into, you know, seasoned soldiers of Christ or not. But the trick is, is, can you get through a temptation? Yes, by choosing Christ, but also keeping still. Or do you allow the temptation to now, quote unquote, make you a portal to hell, by which now you begin to man be bringing in all kinds of demonic activity through your refusal to bear the cross. And now you tempt your brothers, your sisters. You see what I'm saying? Oh, oh, so it's like an increase in the sickness. It's like. You're and you're dragging people down with yeah, you. Yeah, you you're you're choosing to become a carrier. Okay. I see. So so it's worse when you it's worse to fail a, a a test than for someone who's let's say outside of the church who well we could say like doesn't know better, like doesn't know Christ at all, and then this temptation for them to do something, right? It's that's not as bad as the person who's who knows what to do is tested and fails the test. Oh, yeah. oh not Cyprian. even close, right? Hey, Cyprian, with great power comes great responsibility. There you go. Well, yeah, okay, that's it. Spider Man, right there. Yeah, yeah, that's so, a Spider Man story, right? Because if it's like if he didn't have the powers and he let the guy go past, if he's just normal Peter Parker, it's not just a tragedy. Thing. Yeah, it's just a tragedy. There's no like. He doesn't have the responsibility or the capability to actually like affect the change. Okay, yeah. I get that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I I could go on and on about that, but I don't want to. I'm gonna ask Father. So um I'm sorry. So I've heard that like by through his divine nature, Christ was never actually tempted. Like mm-hmm. like his his through his divine nature, like I this all comes from a video I watched. Are you talking about with the Greek priest on Oprah? There you go. Okay, like, let's just, yeah, like, there was a little bit of Christ, if you want to say. Um, I think there was a little bit, I love that video because that priest is his boss, whatever. But, so on the one hand, yeah, okay, you could go from that angle of like, oh, he wasn't tempted because to be tempted, you had to be willing to sin. But that would be a wrong theological statement, right? Because it, it becomes very problematic in regards of getting into like some kind of weird heresy where like Christ really wasn't human. Well, he was human, right? And so the thing is, is being tempted isn't a sin, <laughs> right? Mm. Being tempted isn't a sin. Giving in to the temptation, ascending or assenting to the temptation, that's the sin, right? So I instead of uh, 
that statement is like, uh, you know, Christ has Christ go, went through and, and has gone through everything we can go through, but he's done it sinlessly. So temptation, right, is necessary. It, the scripture says it right there, right? And even the scripture says Christ was tempted. But the way in that video that it was being used, I think that 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 dear father was responding to a, a more general kind of like spirit behind that versus the actual words that were being used. So the yeah, no, that makes what I no, yes, I see exactly what you're saying. And that's nice because for me, I was like, oh boy, have I got this big thing about Christ wrong? And I'm sure I do in some spirit, but it was like it was like it seemed like I had kind of understood Christ to because like in the Passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson movie, he's like, he's like, he's afraid, kind of like he's like shuddering when the devil's talking to him. And I was like, okay, there's like this human nature there that I'm maybe I'm not comfortable with or something like that about seeing that from Christ. Yeah, I mean, he's struggling. Let's not say he's afraid in the sense. He's struggling. Okay, that's a that's a better interpretation. Struggling. Yeah. And and I think the other thing too is you gotta take in mind that that priest was talking about and responding to the temptation of the Christ, the movie. The Willem Dafoe movie. Okay, I don't, I haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, then it's hard to kind of see the context and the the context of uproar that that was around it. So like, so so that clip, I don't, we don't need to belabor too much on it because it's just a clip that's out of context, not just like out of context of the show, but also out of the context of like, well, what was happening at the time with that movie Presentation of Christ and like how that all plays out because that's all part of the context that he's addressing. Okay. Right? So, so, yeah, what I wanted to say was I had never heard temptation presented that way. As I was like, Christ couldn't really, I guess, I guess I don't know if my point's mute now, but it's like, uh, Christ couldn't really be tempted because by his nature, his way is Christ. So like the temptation to deviate from the way of Christ in and of itself, that's like a contradiction to say. So I like, think the thing is understand is just if you understand and even on the face of that, right, it's like when you read the ascetical literature of the church, right, and even the commentary of like, oh, I was in temptation. Like that's a very common thing. I mean, it's just part of the spiritual life, being in temptation, right? So temptation doesn't mean that you are the thing. Okay. Right, so I like, that's a, yeah, that's the important. holiest person is going to be tempted. And I mean, Christ was tempted, right? Like, temptation isn't the problem. The holiest person is going to be tempted. Mother of God was tempted, St. John Chrysostom was tempted, St. Nicholas was tempted. Oh, St. Anthony blah, blah, blah. the Great, I mean, St. Anthony the Great was tempted. I mean, so we have to understand when we talk about temptations, what we're talking about, we're not talking about I have done this thing. And it's real hard for me not to do it. That's not, that's a level of temptation, meaning you have either assented to something or you have this practice of something and it's a passion and it has a hold of you, right? That's a level of temptation like we can even like discuss. But when we're talking about temptation in the context of like Christ being tempted, temptation in regards of like what St. Joseph the Hesychat says of like, you have to, you're not going to escape temptations. You have to endure, or even this scripture in Matthew, temptations must come because of the fallen nature of the world, right? And our free will must be tested. But really, right, I bring this up because people go like, well, I thought God doesn't tempt because the scripture says God doesn't tempt. But when we are drawn by our own desires or tempted. So this is where that scripture the priest could be talking about could be also refer- referenced to. But the way you reconcile these seemingly, they're not, but seemingly contradictory things is that the temptation, right, in the sense of being tempted to deviate from the commandments of God, right, Christ Christ endured those temptations like every holy person must. So temptation. because Because of free will, right? But it's not the same thing as being tempted because, hey, I was a fornicator. And it's really hard for me to say no because it's ingrained in me and I like it. That's not the same use of the word temptation. And I'm sure someone in the keyboard world can like go, well, actually, that's why. Because in the Greek, this means this. And I don't know it in that sense. But I'm telling you in regards to how it's translated for us, 
when you read temptation, the ascetical literature, it isn't the same as someone who's being pulled by their prior ascent to a, to a vice or their passions, right? It, there's overlap, but it's not the same because Christ wasn't tempted like that. Christ didn't have any sin to be tempted with in that context. That's why he says the rule of the world has come. He's found nothing in me. He's found nothing in me because Christ was tempted in the sense of the nexus point of being tested, right? But like the scripture says, God doesn't tempt, right? We are tempted when we're pulled by our evil desires. So there's a language issue here, right? There's a language issue in regards of how we're defining the word tempt, right? So what would you call being pulled to a former passion then? Like what would you call? In our language, we call it temptation. Okay. But it's like, help me out. There's going to be words where we use it in one context. It has a meaning. And then a different context, it has almost a different or very, very similar, but in the same sense, disparate meaning from the other one. That's how the English language works sometimes, right? Hmm. So would it be fair to say that like temptation is like an event? Like like an action is an event. Temptation is an event, right? So the crossroads, you're standing at the crossroads, right? You're at a crossroads. Yeah. Right. You're at a crossroads to either follow the path of Christ or to not. Okay. Right. To follow the world, the flesh, the devil. Right. Mm. And Mm. Christ was tempted in such a way to deviate from the commandments of the Father. Right. But he wasn't tempted in the sense of like, I am a druggie and I no longer do them, but I still kind of could. That's not the way that he was tempted. Hmm. Are, are you following me? No. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of um, when Christ is praying in the garden of Gethsemane mm-hmm. and he's, you know, there's a, there's a definite struggle there and there's a feeling that, Oh, there is actually a choice here, mm-hmm. you know, because he's saying, if it be your will, take this cup from me that I'm about to drink. Right. But not my will, but yours be done. So mm-hmm. it's like there seems to be that very clearly a choice. And he's and he's crying and his sweat is coming down and it's like blood and it's like the whole thing. Like there's clearly a struggle going on. If there was no choice, how could that struggle even occur? Yeah. You know? Right. And that's that's the key thing is temptation has to come because all human beings are endowed with a measure of free will. Mm -hmm. And in order to have free will, it necessitates that there's actual choice. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And the world has fallen. Right. And the predisposition is towards sin. That doesn't mean you have to. Right. But that temptation to, and, and again, everything's different now because we're past pit cost. Right. Because there's a level of right and wrong that people people have always had, Romans 1 says as much, people have always in their hearts known about the creator versus the creation. That's that's a foregone conclusion if you, if you read what Paul says. But there is even greater potential to resist it post-Pentecost because the Holy Spirit's been poured out on the world in a way that it wasn't before. And Christendom mm-hmm. spread throughout the world. We're in a post-Christian age and now you know, this gets into a whole thing about, you know, uh, Christ is really reigning now in the hearts of the people, but, you know, the devil is loosed right now, mm. right? Mm. And so the restraining force is, you know, uh, not as it was, right? Um, lawlessness abounds and, and is growing. So, that temptation has to be there. Hey, fa- I'm sorry, Father. Fa- forgive me. Forgive me. I'm trying to. I, I, I'm trying to understand what, what what you just said. So it sounds like, though, since we're after Pentecost, that there's a set of spiritual tools that humanity has that they that we didn't have before. Correct. To, to put it in a crude way. Correct. Right? But then it sounds like you're also saying that the power of the evil one has commensurately increased in that time? No. The power of the evil one has increased really since the fall of Christendom. 
Ah, okay. So I that's see why the czar. And now I see what you're saying. That's why the czar is such a big deal. And that's okay. the end. You would say that's the end. That's kind of the fall. That's the the czar is such a big deal because now with the end of actual Christian authority, and then right the the subsequent kind of aftershock of that is where we're at now in regards of morality, right? Because mm-hmm. morality is a binding force. Remember, I always talk about moralism isn't the thing, mm-hmm. but I try to tell people that doesn't mean we're amoral. That doesn't mean morals don't matter, but moralism and morality in the system using it's not the same thing, right? Moralism gets more in that, sh- that same spirit of the Pharisee and that asceticism for asceticism's sake. And moralism is about your subjective perspective on what you deem to be right and wrong. And that holding mm-hmm. to that, there's a vaingloriousness attached to moralism. Right. Mm-hmm. But morality, right. Christi- Christianity ha- has morality inherent to it. Right. Mm-hmm. Christian morality, which is not moralism. Right. Mm-hmm. It gets into the heart, not the external behavior. Right. It's the because marriage. it's more of a description than a prescription. Right. It's like the, the Christian morality is what happens when you're following Christ, as opposed yes. to what you tell other people that they should be doing. Yes. Or what you could do just to maintain right. appearances or external. Right? OK. Got it. Yep. OK. So subsequent to the banishment of Christian government and law, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. which includes the embracing of that authority of mm-hmm. God over a people, right, and the people embracing that, mm-hmm. the subsequent fruit of it is we are at it now. Like this is the – this there was no other way. Once people have, once people reject law, and that's why even you know I don't care. Uh, the broken clock is right even twice in a day. If you want right. to get into some of these people that talk about the Tinker Mags being pulled out of the courthouse, prayer right. being pulled out of the courthouse, listen. Protestantism, Protestantism is is not is not the church. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a system of man, but that doesn't mean that there isn't aspects or components there that God can't or didn't or won't bless. Right. If someone's reading, if someone's reading the scripture with a, with a sincere heart, even though they're not Orthodox, Mm -hmm. listen, if someone's searching for truth, really searching for truth and they want to search for Christ as much as, as, and as far as they can understand him, guess what guys, Christ isn't like, Christ isn't Zeus where he's like, Oh, you you lost a technicality. Which I just want to close this loop real quick because there's gonna I know I know for a fact there's people just tweaking out right now over the baptism thing. Listen, just to make it really clear, right? If you weren't baptized because you were denied it, I said this before, right? right. Didn't I say yes. this before? Yes, yes. Well, I'll say it again, right? If you weren't baptized because you were denied it by a bishop or a priest. And you you authentically asked for it, but you did not want to cross the line of being disrespectful or disobedient. God's going to work it out for you. Oh yeah, that's on the priest. That's on the bishop, right? And God knows that. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't want to get it because you didn't want to get wet and you're being lazy and you didn't care, well, that's on you. Okay. So if you really want a baptism, and you didn't get baptized. Don't don't get upset, right? If you really pray, God's going to work it out for you, right? Whether you find someone who's going to do it for you or not, I don't know. Point being is, that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about something different. That's a whole different temptation that the church has fallen into. And unfortunately, many of the church have fallen into that temptation of hearing what the world and what the devil has to say about a sacrament. And there's a reason for that. What does it serve? Is what I, I mean, I, we know. What who does it serve, serve not to have people I'm baptized? Saying, yes. I can tell you what it serves. Okay. There are, there are, anomalies, distortions, aberrations that come from people who have not been mm-hmm. baptized. Mm-hmm. It's real simple. Oh, yeah. The exorcism, oh, I, oh, the exorcism okay. hasn't happened. Okay. Their ability to, to take in and imbibe the scriptures, obedience. Okay. There's all okay. kinds of okay. spiritual birth defects that happen. And I'm telling you from experience. Uh, this is why you say this. Is, okay, I got it. I'm telling you from I, experience. I got it. Okay. This, isn't, this isn't like, oh, like forgive me number one i just need to make this clear god bless father peter for the hard work he did because that book is incredible mm-hmm. but just for all clear 
you could have came and talked to me 10 years ago and I'd be telling you the same thing. Well, you told me the same thing. I told you the same thing. So it was long before the book. Yeah. This is long before, you know what I mean? So yes. just so we're clear. Because I was because I had an infant baptism into Roman Catholicism. Yeah. But there was not a question of whether that, or not I was going to be baptized or yeah. not. Yeah. So, yeah. Father, I'm sorry. St. Cosmas says, holy priests, you must have a large baptismal font. You must have large baptismal fonts in your churches so that the entire child can be immersed. Mm-hmm. The child should be able to swim in it so that not even an area as large as a tick's eye remain dry. Mm-hmm. Because it is from there the dry area that the devil advances. And this is why your children become epileptics or possessed by demons, have fear, Whoa. suffer misfortune. They haven't been baptized properly. Whoa. So even just missing this one little part. Like yeah. I mean, a... yeah. And like, you know, again, that's one of those things people can run with it, but like getting to the key thing of like, if a, if a, <laughs> if a priest this is you know what i mean i just i don't want to that's a it's great not, quote that's a great quote but just someone could take it out of context i think right it's not right, a technicality right. it's not a technicality right, yeah, right, yeah, right you know right, what i mean right, right. it's not a technicality right but an even more appropriate like if you read what like for instance with saint luca crimea saint luca the surgeon talks about you know what i mean and that's just one example i mean one mm-hmm. of so many but this thing is really key and i just i want to be clear it isn't, but it isn't about baptism, right? Because the ability to resist temptation is great, can be, how about this one, can be greatly diminished in the absence of baptism. Why? Because it's not, because the regenerative power isn't there. It's not there. The exorcisms haven't been bestowed. The regenerative power isn't, listen, God can do whatever he wants, Okay. You can timestamp that, whatever. You know what I mean? If you want to make a whole case on it, that's on you. I am saying formally, God can do whatever he wants, right? But the standard by which God is given through the Holy Spirit to the church is the standard for a reason. And the exceptions really prove the rule, right? Because you ain't saying Procopius. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not Dismas. You're not, right? So, so what's going on? And the thing is, is these... These things, right? Pastor Jimmy doesn't believe that baptism is regenerative. So how is Pastor Jimmy going to bestow something to you that you don't, that he doesn't believe in, right? Quite, quite even worse, he, right? He can't. He, he can't. can't. He yeah. can't. And like Saint Luke says, it's it, all they did was have you had water poured on you, right? So the only reason why we care about this, the only reason why people get upset, is because of an ecumenical stance that like it all matters. Like, it's all equal that, you know, it, as long as your son believes in Christ, but then we go down this rabbit hole. Well, okay, well, which Christ? Who's Christ, right? And these are temptations. These are temptations to leave that royal path, right? Because here's the other side of the royal path. The royal path isn't mushy middle, right? The royal path isn't like making sure I'm not too politically left or right. The royal path is what is Christ? Where is Christ? What is he saying? What is the king's road, right? So... The royal path is holding uncompromisingly to what our Lord taught because our Lord taught it, right? And the Lord teaches it not out of arbitrariness, right? But the Lord desires that there wouldn't be any spiritual stillborns. The Lord desires that his sheep, his people, that they wouldn't perish because of lack of knowledge. And lack of knowledge, not lack of information, but the knowledge that's bestowed upon you noetically through things like baptism and the sacrament of confession, right? These things are not bestowed upon you because you figured it out, right? They're bestowed upon you through mercy and it's grace, right? So that lack of knowledge is what causes people to perish. So this is really key because people get tempted and they don't know why. They don't know how to get out of it. And then that begins a whole cycle where the enemy can get a, a real hook in them. And then you got real problems. Because I'm going to say this, right? There is like people, uh, if the devil can, he will kill you. If the devil can, he will drag you to hell. That's just, I'm sorry. That's, I know that's, no one wants to hear that. It's just the truth. The devil exists. Hell exists. It doesn't matter what philosopher what cool guy, whatever anybody says. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? 
you can not believe it all you want until you face it, right? And we can get into like, what is it, blah, 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 right? But at the end of the day, your inability to pursue your, excuse me, it's not inability, your unwillingness, right? Unwillingness, Orthodox yeah. Christian, right? Your unwillingness is, is, is the thing that will condemn you, right? And it all starts with, are you ignorant of the wiles of the devil, as St. Paul talks about? And this is why knowing what temptations are and that they must come, but that you want to, you want to do what you need to do to have that temptation tran be transfigured into a testing. Because when it's a testing, when God's testing you, that's blessed, right? And he's testing you to have you come out on the right side. But the devil's tempting you to get you to fall. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I think that just clicked. Okay, so maybe a temptation that you're talking about that's not so much in the historically known definition of temptation is more like maybe brought on by yourself. Like, I'm sorry, maybe you've covered this and I just missed it. And this is just, but like, oh, I used to have a problem with sweets, you know, and like, oh, I'm really looking at those brownies. Like maybe the devil so much isn't involved in that. Is that kind of what you're trying to say? Like, like that temptation is more like your energy being drawn to that rather than like the yeah, actual yeah. like energy sitting right there where yeah, you're just. So let's, okay. So let's, let's like, like rank it. And there's. I, I mean, everyone knows I'm a terrible priest, right? And I don't know anything. So I know there's someone out there who's read something and they're going to pull out like this ranking of father so-and-so has a whole ranking and level of it and put it in the comments and God bless you. Um, I'm just saying from experience, like let's, let's break this down, right? According to Matthew 18, when the, when the Lord says that temptations must come into the world, right? And, if I, and right, I know we're kind of beating on it, but whatever. Why do must temptations come into the world? Why? Right? Why is it necessary? Right? This is part of the lie, and this is part of the rebuttal and accusation, by the way, that Lucifer, that Satan uses against God. But why did he do it this way? That's not fair. Like he, he already made it stacked against you. Like, like what were you going to do? You see, right? But he's, but he's the one who's bringing the temptations. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, he could stop. Yeah, he, he could stop. He could, he could stop. He stop. Well, then but, stop. If it's not, if it's yeah, unfair, he, then stop. Yeah, he's, he's not going to stop. Right? Going. He's not going to stop. <laughs> right. So, so the temptations have to come because of free will, right? And because Man is fallen, and Christ has made the way for man to return in repentance, right? The second Adam, right? He's the second Adam. Are you following me? But temptation had to come. That's just that this, I mean, this gets us all the way back. And there's a rich tradition of the fathers of how what the temptation of Adam and Eve was really about, right? And they were going to eat the fruit eventually, but it was just premature, you know? And God wasn't some sicko who put these kids in a pit of snakes to see what would happen, right? But there's a reality, right? And this it, this gets even into, like, people not understanding what the quote-unquote tree of good and evil is, right? I digress. Getting to temptation, right? There is this reality that temptation must come. Matthew, right? 18. Why? Man is created free because of that temptation. The devil is always seeking to pull us away from God, pull us away from the path of the commandments of God, right? Okay. That has to happen. St. Joseph the Hesychast, he says, you're not going to avoid temptations. If you try to live a life without temptations, you won't be saved, right? Because you know what, some, you know what a, a people looks like who try to live without temptations? Millennials, Right. They just want comfort, yeah. pleasure, everything to be okay, no struggle, no fight, no philotimo. Okay? You gotta have philotimo, right? You gotta have this love, this self sacrificial love. You gotta have this, like, this ornery, crazy love, right? And it's only, it's only revealed in struggle and in temptation, right? 
So it, it has its purpose, right? But people would say, but the scripture says God doesn't tempt. But it's when we are drawn away by our own lust that we're tempted. And that is true. So how do you reconcile this? Well, like what you're saying, Andrew, the demons know that you are a full on Dr. Pepper fiend and that you, you know, kill your dog to drink Dr. Pepper. Right. And they know that because they've been watching you and studying you. Right. And they know it's still in you. So they know how to draw that to give you logis me, to give you assaultive thoughts, to move people in your life who are not in Christ whether it's the guy that you see at the quick trip every time that you go there on Thursday or to coworker, they know how to move the chess pieces to facilitate temptation. But ultimately it's because they can sense it in you. And so they set up the things to draw it out like a magnet, right? Okay. That's another kind of temptation, right? But see the person, this is where asceticism comes in. What is the point of asceticism? The point of asceticism for an Orthodox Christian is to divest themselves of the stuff that makes up the passions so that you can say like Christ, the rule of the world has come and he's found nothing in me. That's the point of asceticism, right? So that you can get, you remember that great scene in X-Men, which X-Men was it? Where Mystique pumps the lead in the dude's butt, right? X-Men 2. X-Men 2 pumps yeah. the lead in the dude's butt because Magneto's in the plastic cage. Yeah. It's like, have we got you, Magneto? Yeah. He's like, oh, you've got more iron in your blood, you know, guard Maxo or whatever. So yeah. that's that's exactly it. Magneto is the demon, and you're the fat, greasy, uh, lazy security guard who wanted to fornicate with the girl in the bathroom, and you got duped and pumped with a bunch of lead. That's exactly it. And they could smell it in you, right? But if you hadn't have done that, if you hadn't have gone with the chick and fornicated in the bathroom, by the way, that's in the movie, guys. It's not just me being weird. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have had all that lead in you, right? So that's what the ascetic does. But guess what? Even the ascetic who purifies himself, he's still going to be tempted. Because there's temptations from the left and temptations from the right. But it's the, external. It's external to him. It's external to him. It's mm. external to him, right? Temptations from the left, gluttony, sloth, right? Temptations from the right, self-righteousness, pride, right? Most actual ascetics, if they're actually becoming ascetics, are tempted from the right. Mm. And this is what I've said. I can take someone with God's help, and I've done it so many times with God's help. I can get people off of fornicating and drugs yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Done it, right? There's, my parish yeah. is full of people, right? You know it's really hard? Getting them off of their self-righteousness, mm. their pride, their mm. vanity. Especially, especially if they just got off of the fornication yep. and the drugs and yep. all of that. Yeah. <laughs> especially yep. if they yep. just got off of yep. that. Super hard. Super hard. <laughs> So what they need to understand is your temptations are going to change now. Let me let me just show this, and I'll just say this. This is not, if you hear this, and you're like, oh, Father, blah, blah, blah. Listen, you're not the only one who has said this to me, so it's okay, right? But I will tell you a common thing, right? People get off of porn. People get off of self-abuse, right? And then they're hit with like, number one, I'm judging people. That is the first thing that hits them. It's not just one person. It's a common human thing, right? It's common when people get off of some sort of sexual sin, right? But more importantly, something that is inherently um, self-love, which self-abuse is the ultimate manifestation of self-love, right? Judging is the thing that they review. But see, they've all, they'd always been judging. That's what they don't know, Right. But that has gotten out of the way, and now you're dealing with temptations from the right. So those temptations now, you can turn them into the blessing because God's allowing them to come for your chastisement, for your further purification. And then when you get in the habit of embracing them and working with God in that temptation, now it's God's allowing you to be tempted to bring about a testing, 
right? Ding, did the sword hold up? Ding, did the sword, did the sword hold up? That's, that's what you want, right? So it's like, I'm tempted with judging. I'm not going to judge, you know, like USN, cast for stone, like whatever you want to say to get out of it. And then even being like, you know, practicing self-accusation, like, who am I to judge? Look what I did last night. You know what I mean? Mm. Or look how I'm, you know what I mean? Look how I'm thinking, right? And that practice, that's a type of asceticism right there, self-accusation, right? Just being honest about, you know, how broken you are. Then what happens is, is now you've risen above that temptation. So instead of just sitting there for half an hour while you're in, in traffic, just judging everybody, not even stopping, you're like, what am I doing? Like I'm, I'm literally, I'm literally like killing someone in my mind, you know, I'm judging them to death, right? You stop it. And then you ask God to forgive you and ask for help. Now you're starting to rise above it, right? And then when it comes again, you have some practice and it's just like, okay, yeah, I'm not giving into that level of, of um, traffic judgment. Now it's up to like, okay, I got to make sure not to judge, you know, uh, Juanita and Juju uh, at work now because it's really easy to judge them. You see what I'm saying? It's just like it's up a level, right? Okay, now I got I can't judge my wife now. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it just goes up these levels, right? But with those levels, it becomes testing and you're, you're seeing that like, okay, if I'm following Christ's commandments and I'm, I'm enduring the cross and the small things, he's going to give me the strength to resist. Resist the devil and he will flee, mm. right? That's the scripture. Right. But unfortunately, people, they don't believe. And well, so, on, the no, on the note of, resi- uh, for, mm-hmm. forgive me, Father, on the note of resistance and, and on this sort of self accusation, and it ties back into the baptism thing and, and how for me, I, there's no question in my mind that it's like this is a real, objectively real thing that is happening for that, for in this exact context. And the context is, before baptism, and it was almost like it was an immediate switch after baptism. Mm-hmm. It was almost an immediate switch that it's like, that's before baptism, that self-accusation and that, um, like, there's a feel, a, a, a real feeling of, like, a shot of adrenaline like fight or flight, like I'm about to enter into a flight, mm-hmm. into a fight, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that happens... Now, in a situation where, like, I'm about to judge somebody, and I will actually get that feeling Mm -hmm. in a way that was only intellectual before baptism. Mm -hmm. Like, before Mm -hmm. baptism, it was intellectual in the way, like, maybe afterwards I think, oh, I probably shouldn't have judged that person. And maybe I'll think think externally, oh, would other people perceive me as judging this person or something? But now it's like, in, in, in the best of situations, before it's about to happen... Like I will actually get a feeling, like a strong feeling that that is that is like fight or flight, like like almost like being signaled that this is the test. This is a test that's coming right here. You're about to get into a fight right here. That's the event. So the temptation is an event thing. But yeah. but am I am I just is is this? I know this is can't no. be unique to no, me, right? That's, like this is a real thing, right? It's called <laughs> it's called the grace that was bestowed upon you in baptism. It's okay. called the work of the Holy Spirit within you. Okay. Okay. No. It's just, yeah. No, and, I mean, and I'll tell you, here's the thing. Forgive me, Andrew. I just want to say this. Woe to lots of you because you can lose that. Mm. Let's just be clear. Right. Mm. Uh, that's not, that's not theory. That's not theory. You can lose that. And God help you. It's a long road back from that mm. because that's when people fall back into their, temptations right because <clears throat> they've grieved the spirit and they've endured in their pride and like the lord jesus christ said to Siloan, the proud are always tempted by devils yeah so guard that well not just you supreme but anyone who has it guard it well because well into you if you think that it's it, you're entitled to it. You're not. It'll be taken from you very quick. It's like the um I think like I've always likened it a little bit that event you're talking about, Cyprian, 
which father is that the same thing what you're talking about is that the same thing as your conscience becoming numb or dead where you're like not even realizing like that something you're doing is wrong is that kind of what is that what you're kind of talking about because we've talked about before you know just in passing about like oh i'm not even realizing that this is wrong like but like oh it is and then like having to like but God. but, but what, I, what i'm describing is something different than that right? sure it's not that. because it's, it's not, not e it's not even about whether it's right or wrong it's a real feeling of there is a threat that i am about to get it's, into a no, fight it's with a right visceral, now. it's not it's a visceral <laughs> yeah. thing it's, it's a visceral the, thing it's so the there's, there's, sorry go ahead father there's like we talked i talked about this before right like you okay you can get baptized and not have your conscience formed. Happens to all kinds of people. They're just dunked. They're baptized, and that's great. God bless, whatever. But they're they're not they're not formed, so they don't have they don't have a proper conscience, right? Because you're not given a conscience automatically. You have the work of the Holy Spirit in you. <clears throat> you have your guardian angel helping you, and the and that and there's that grace is working within you from inside. And I'm not talking about having some sort of scholastic academic formation. I'm talking about real catechism in regards to like how to protect the grace, how to approach holy things in a worthy manner, how to like handle yourself in humility, all those things that will allow you to be a vessel that doesn't shoo away the Holy Spirit, right? That's what I mean by a formed conscience. I don't mean in a uh, Thomist sense, Right, because that's how like the Catholics would see it, like in a Thomist sense. I'm not talking about Thomas Aquinas and his theology. Okay, I'm talking okay. about like down to earth. Why you got to teach your kids what's right and what's wrong? Right, that formation that has to come from baptism, which is catechism. Right, that's a thing. Right, so that overlaps also with this blessing of a sensitivity of discerning and being aware when because that's a that's every christian should be aspiring to have discernment of, of the spirits that isn't some woo woo thing that's like there's a real high degree that like only like holy elders and priests and like spiritual fathers have and some not even all of them right but every christian should have a measure of it Right. And that's, you know, to whatever degree, I'm not, we're not trying to examine Cyprian right here, but what he's really speaking about is this is a measure of discernment that like, oh, some, some, the evil one is approaching. Yeah. That's different. Right. That's like the conscience overlaps it. Right. And so if your conscience is informed, it becomes a lot harder to discern the wiles of the devil because Cyprian isn't saying that it's always that. Right. There's moments we has to be we, when that conscience that we're speaking about does engage in a more intellectual sense. Absolutely. One hundred percent. Yeah. So, no, it's it's not like, dude, I would be a wreck if it was constantly that. Yeah. But I'm saying that it's that it, it occurs at what feels like key moments. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, this is going to be a key moment for you right here. It's like um, your spidey sense or what I liken it to sometimes is like it's the litany against fear. It's like uh, you see it coming, you you know, and then you keep your cool in the middle of it and then you see it go because like that's that's how it, you know, I'm not the most discerning person without a doubt. Like I, there are plenty of times I dropped the ball and only realize in hindsight my spidey sense was going off a while ago. I just wasn't paying attention to it. Right. But like also there's these moments of like I see it coming. It's here. I can feel it. And I can feel how like the constant irritation, the agitation, the temptation to just snap out at my family or snap out at somebody at somebody at work or something like that. And then like I see what it is batting down the hatches or in a storm, like no non-essential like functions are happening at that point. Like I'm not worried about what am I going to eat for dinner? You know, like I'm it's like, no, purely let's get through this. And then like like um what is a whole long story, but the me getting hired at my job was a whole storm and it was full of temptations for anger and bitterness and father afterwards when things ended up okay, because through grace, like it was a real wave of grace. I, I managed to, to pass that particular part, that, that little, mini th that little tiny thing I managed to get through with God's help. 
And then father was like, you're like a ship that just went through a storm. Now you kind of have to assess what you lost. Like what were the thing, what was some of the cargo, maybe some of the crew members, you know, damaged like the structural integrity of your boat, of your ship. And it's like having to weather that and come out the other side and then assess of what happened, what, what happened, you know, and like, what did you learn? And what did you realize? Maybe some areas of weakness. It's that whole like litany against fear from Dune, you know, like letting it wash over you. Then seeing the way the I don't remember the litany against fear off the top of my head, but then seeing the path, you know, that that led to. And then that's one of the things that's really, really beneficial for people who have done a lot of methamphetamines mm. is it's just like you now kind of know what that evil tastes like especially you did them for decades mm -hmm. like you, by the end it's so not fun anymore it's fun was decades ago like it is mm -hmm. at, at this point you are just like it's the only way to do is just to dance in darkness that's the only thing you know so going into this world of recovery you now are wholly acquainted with what evil to some degree looks and feels like and now you can carry that knowledge with you forward and you can start to say like wait this is starting to feel like that this is starting to feel like how I felt like mm -hmm. when I was doing that. And I'm sensing something familiar about mm -hmm. this situation mm -hmm. and uh, yep. all that awareness. It's just yep. it's awareness. Yep. So. yep. Ooh, temptations. Yeah. I think, I think we're at two hours though. We're pretty darn close. Yeah. Um, Did you guys watch the, uh, uh, Senate, uh, the the hearing on the UFOs. Did you guys? I've seen clips. I've seen a few clips. I'm not. Uh, I I really feel like there's a big scam. Yeah, it's there's a, a big over scam here. taking place, dude. Because I feel like the answers that are being given. I feel like that they're 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 trying to make you think that it's aliens without saying that it's aliens. So here's my observation yeah i would agree because i don't know i got through about an hour and a half of it and because mm -hmm. i had it on while i was doing notes at work and i just had it on in the background and i don't know i never heard them say that alien i never heard no them they never did that that's the whole thing that's what i'm saying non non-human organics or something like that it was yeah but like that could that. be a cat or a but dog when he course. said that i was like well what does that even mean non-human so organics here's what i found Here's what I found. Could be a, it could be weed. It could be a, it could be cannabis. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Like <laughs> of the three of us, I think it has been proven time and time again. I'm the most susceptible to like a narrative that's being pushed. So of right. the three of us. So what I will say is that where I found myself being pushed when I was watching this was I started rooting for these three dudes. Mm -hmm. I started being like, these three guys are the ones who are exposing everything. These heroes. three heroes, heroes are yeah. coming forward. And I knew this is all happening, like kind of like on like a quote unquote subconscious level, because if I really had stopped and thought about it, like, no, these guys are just the other side of the same. It's a different hand of the same monster. It's not we're not like, you know, we're not anyway. So what I found is like and then the part came where it's like, no, we have to learn from them. They were right. saying it now. We have to start integrating the things yeah. that they've they they know into our technology and to like be able to so like then suddenly I like woke up and I was like, Oh, these guys aren't the heroes at all. Like, you know, th no. they're just part of the problem. This is just a whole different we need to give it, them rights. Yeah, we need to give the demons rights, is what they're saying. Yeah. I found it very like and then and, and then this is the last thing I'll say. According to public knowledge, mm -hmm. now these things are pretty much confirmed, right? So I'm talking to, I was talking to my second yeah. oldest daughter, who's like a teenage, who's a teenager, like 17 years old. And I was texting her, UFOs confirmed. You know, I was just like trying to make conversation mm -hmm. with her or whatever. And I said, UFOs UFO confirmed, like this is a thing. Mm -hmm. So like, and then she looked into it and she's with a bunch of her friends and she looked at she said, guys. Aliens and UFOs have pretty much just been confirmed by the government that they exist. And all of her friends are like, yeah, we know. Like, so what? And I'm like, yeah, okay, exactly. what has taken place in the last 25 years that has got people apathetic towards this? Like, what took place where suddenly 
this 25 years ago, we're talking like prime X files on the air era of like the only people that would even acknowledge that these things were around were the crazy tinfoil hat people that, you know, whatever. Now, 25 years later, all those people are quote unquote, and this is all according to the public narrative. We all know Mm -hmm. there's more at play, quote unquote, confirmed these people were right all along, but nobody cares. Well, it's a regression to the it's a regression to the mean. Like we're actually just return. Really, what what it is, is that everything before this for like the past 200 years was a blip because everybody before 200 years ago absolutely knew that there were things that we couldn't explain that flew through the sky that people would see from time to time. Uh, Every culture, everywhere, Mm -hmm. but they understood them as spiritual entities, either demons or gods, or it's like, because, Mm. dude, you you think every culture, you look at every ancient culture, it's it's in the... um, it's in the ancient Vedic texts, the Hindu texts, talking about the gods flying around, shooting each other, chariots. flying around, flying around in sky chariots and shooting each other. Mm. So it's like at, we've known this is not new because they're demons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every culture has known that they're demons. It's only in the Enlightenment that we had a great forgetting, which is the Enlightenment, and we got into scientism, and everybody forgot everything that was real. And we entered into this fake age for 200 years, 300 years, 400 years. And and now we're we're in the day. Yeah, and Marvel packaged it and made it sexy. There you go. Because our tech is like, well, what what humans call it magic, it's really our our Asgardian tech. Oh, that totally makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Which is like, I remember taking umbrage with that at the time in the movies. But that's a different topic for a different time. I like the great forgetting. Is that a term you've come up with, Cyprian? Or is that like, is that pr- like in the vernacular? Like, do uh, I think some people, more people are referring to the Enlightenment as a forgetting. Because I think and that's it, exactly what yeah. it is. It's just like, it this, yeah, it's like this whole like, we're going to ignore again. It's like, maybe that's where some of the programming started. Obviously, if someone went far, back farther than that, it's like, no, we want to acknowledge about 40% of reality because mm-hmm. that's that's yep. the part and part we can control that's the part unquote. we can control exactly that's it. quote unquote mm-hmm. yeah exactly. i don't know mm-hmm. it's i it was mind-blowing to me but it's a I, setup too because you got so many people tying back to the temptation thing and even the millennial thing right you got a lot of people in the church yeah a, a lot of christians man they are just chomping at the bit to let let it go Yep. They just want an excuse to be like, yeah, I knew this whole thing was bunk. I, I, I knew this asceticism, the cross, um, you know, saying that LGBTQ isn't okay. Like all the things, all, 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 of, all of the boundaries, they're just chopping at the bit. To just, And the only reason why they don't is because they, they have that nostalgic – cultural guilt of like they still got their mommy or daddy kind of in the in the in the back of their ear but they're just looking for that thing to just let go of the church let go of christ and there were one huge step closer to just like throwing it all off because like yeah aliens i knew this whole thing was bunk you gotta understand that you gotta understand there's so many people who are just they're right there and they need this to really be like i mean Ridley Scott's been prepping him with, uh, sure. you know what I mean? Prometheus, yeah. For Prometheus, right? This Dr. Stephen okay, I, I, I found, this for, forgive me, Forgive me, guys. So, uh, child, Childhood's End? Childhood's End? Like they made a, a miniseries? Arthur C. Clarke? I mean, this is it. This is it. Yeah. You know, the, the, the whole premise is, oh, the aliens come. And what is it, a hundred years that they give like technology? They're hanging around, they give technology for a hundred years, and then they're gonna reveal themselves at the end of the hundred years, and it what and the alien walks off the ship and it's a it's a, a straight demon? up demon. <laughs> like it looks just like Satan. Like how yeah. do you imagine Where do you, Satan? I need to, to look? see this by the way. To... Childhood's end. It's incredible. And it's just like, oh yeah, they're just demons. Yeah. And like they're that's... just demons pretending to be aliens. <laughs> That's what I 
I said it was like, look, sweetheart, you can stay where you are <laughs> in the rabbit hole, but like I'm gonna go one step further mm-hmm. and say like, like, and you can stay up at the top of the rabbit hole and just look down and be like, I'm good. But like, I was like, but here's the thing: is is like these are demons. They're demons. Like these things are demons. They're not aliens. I was like, there's absolutely no proof mm-hmm. that they come from outer space. There's no proof. They just well, that's an assumption. And even she was like, oh, you're right. She's like, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, there is no, like, why would, and I was like, yeah. And then pulled the Father Seraphim Rose arguments out. Is like, why, if they are so advanced, do they keep crashing? Like, why does that <laughs> keep happening? If they are such an advanced species, how come they keep crashing and injuring themselves in these crashes? Also, how come in the time that these reports have been reported or whatever, their technology is not advanced? Nothing has ever advanced mm. with them. Like it's always been the same exact things doing the same exact crazy weird things in the sky. These are all points that Father Seraphim Rose with his extremely or Saint Seraphim Rose enlightened mind saw. It's just very practical down to earth arguments about like this is why this narrative doesn't work. It just doesn't make sense if you examine it for more than five minutes. But, you know, to Cyprian's point, I think that's, or to, to rather to Father's point, I think that's the point at which a lot of people, yeah, are looking to jump off. It's just like, it just reinforces the notion that it's like, okay, well, if this is not talked about in Christianity, even though it is, and it's not addressed as though, like, you know, um, this just reinforces the narrative of science. It's just like, well, over... The- I mean, I find it fascinating, the, the Vatican. I mean, whatever, having a good time, right? Uh, we're just talking. I find it fascinating the Vatican has that uh, telescope, Lucifer. Yeah. You know what I mean? They have the Lucifer telescope. Yeah. They have the Lucifer telescope. I find that fascinating. You know what I mean? And and um, I, I'll tell you, you know, St. Gabriel of Georgia, he says, in the last days, man will be looking to the skies in expectation for salvation. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's like people want this stuff so they can, like, what they think is salvation, which is like, being told that they're right, being told that, that their passions and their desires and all the thing is like, mm-hmm. it's good. They don't want the cross. They don't want Christ. People don't want Christ. Yeah. They don't. They, they want what they want. And how long after? Yeah, you're right. Because like the, the confirmation of being correct and then this, the like the quote unquote sexiness, the romance of like this alien species descending to be like you we've decided it's time for you guys to be enlightened and oh man you guys have these antiquated religions like christianity still around don't you know how transphobic and homophobic and racist those religions are or or even better ridley scott jesus is one of us oh they're gonna do do that by the way yeah we sent him to you to enlighten you but you killed him and then you totally misconstrued his message and mm-hmm. you co-opted it for the sake of power. But we've, we, we've, so we sent Muhammad and we sent this and that and, you know, and we tried to warn you and you bring because it to this, this clarity. It's the prophet narrative. And so now here's the new flip. gospel. Here's the new gospel yeah. for you guys. It's yeah. the prophet narrative inverted. Right. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. the the parable of like I sent my servants and I sent my son yeah. and mm-hmm. murdered all of them. Yeah. Like it's mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Wow, that makes that's and 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 here are here we we've been working with you know this is them switching to each tradition. We've been working with these enlightened leaders within you. Mm-hmm. You know, um, your gates certain certain certain, certain metropolitan from a certain. Um, jurisdiction that ends with an O and an A, you know what I mean, and, and an E and a B, and we've been working with them, and and you know they're enlightened, and 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 we've been trying to tell you that like love is love and all these things, and and you have just and these other ones, these backwards ones who have been facilitating hate in the name of our chosen one, our ascended one who we sent to you. Uh, how could you have done this? But let's show them mercy, like. No, no, no. You can't do it the way that you did it before. They can't be tortured. They can't be ostracized. They, they, just let them be. Ostracize them. You know, let them come to their senses, you know? Like, 
Like, we must do this in a compassionate way. You know, all, it's, it's the whole thing, man. And they'll say the same thing to the Muslims, which they're already bought in as it is, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But the but the the ones who are like knee deep in jihad, whatever, you know, and they already got the Catholics. They're going to be like, mm-hmm. man, you know, like, you know, so just just keep it going. I'm just saying so- <laughs> giant telescope, Lucifer. I'm just saying all you have to do is wear a shirt that says I'm in the CIA and nobody will believe you're in the CIA. I'm just, True. it just keeps coming yeah. back to it. It's just like, you don't have to hide it. In fact, do the opposite. Just mm-hmm. put it out there and people will like, they, they like, they won't grasp it. Like, it'll just like, it'll, they'll just slide across the surface. I, I can't think of a proper way to and say it. And it. if forgive me, I just want to connect the dots with people. That's why it brings us full circle. Cause there's no reason why anyone should be arguing against baptism. It just doesn't make any sense Mm-mm. unless there's an agenda. Yep. And like, I don't care. That's fine. You know, where's the Reynolds rap? Bring it on. I'm just saying like the reality is, is like the ecum the ecumenist agenda is a real problem. Not because right. wanting to find Christ and be united in Christ is wrong, but, who, but who, which Christ, you know what right. I mean? And what are we being united around? Are we being united around for the sake of, you know, togetherness in, in the same sense of, of the Tower of Babel? Or are we being united in the sense of Pentecost mm-hmm. and receiving the holy fire and repentance and purification and, and, mm-hmm. and approaching the life, the angelic life that God has intended for all people, right? Yeah. Which, which one is it? You know, that's the problem. That's the problem. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll, we'll see. see. Um, I would go insane if I didn't know for a fact God was going to have the last word. So, Amen. Um, St. Paisios, please Saint pray Paisios. for us. Um, <sighs> so, that's all. Um, we have a website where we sell merch called royalpath.store mm-hmm. we don't see any of that money it goes either to the parish or in one third goes to the person who makes the merch uh we also have a playlist on spotify royal path podcast playlist something like that we mentioned someone on the, like a music artist i try and put some of their music up i know i'm behind i have been for a long time i don't know what's going to change we'll see um and then we also have a way of contacting us, which is Andrew at royalpath.network if you want to talk directly to me. That was the way of contacting the show. I'm terrible at correspondence, and I have a couple unanswered emails right now I will get to. But if you really want to get in contact with Royal Path, go to contact at royalpath.network. We have a wonderful assistant who is very diligent, making sure that those stuff gets answered. Questions are lined up and given to us at a proper time when we can actually answer them. Um, that is the better place to do it. But please, of course, feel free to reach out to me. I just can't promise a quick response. I'm just not good at it. And there's a lot of emails even at my work that go unanswered. So it's just the whole thing. Um, there are also, man, how do I do Jack, is that the thumbnail? Yes, Jack, Jack. Jack, thumbnails. killing it. Again, I just have to say this every week. I, I I stopped for a couple of weeks and I felt really bad. Thank you so much for your service. That's very kind of you. And I'm loving them. You're doing a great job. Um, Then also, I think that's it. Mm-hmm. I think that's it. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. And thanks for having, thanks for having a good night. Is that what I said? Thank, thank That's you for having you me. Oh, yeah, thanks right, thank for you. Seraphim. He's been making shorts. Thanks, Seraphim. Oh, Seraphim with the shorts. Thank you. Seraphim yeah, with great. the shorts. Thank you, Seraphim. Uh, that is actually a huge help. That is a really, really huge help. Yep. So thank Very you, good. Seraphim. Okay. Thank you. That's it. And thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye.